right. Good, good. This is great. I just need to know who I, need to know who I was dealing with. You know. Yeah. Well, so the way this works is, is you know, these two are scholars, and I'm not, and I am the boss. Well. <laughs> Hello and welcome to the episode of Plain Truth, a Holy Spirited podcast. My name is Maggie Almer and I'm on Zoom today with Scott Kisker, David Watson, and our special guest who will introduce himself, Todd Von Helms. Hello, Todd, and thank you for being with us today. Hello, Maggie, Scott, and David, and I'm honored to be with you today. <laughs> well, I'm going to toss this right over to David for just, I don't know, how do we dive in today, David? Well, uh, Todd, thanks for being on the podcast with us. We're really glad uh, to have you on and look forward to hearing some of your story and hearing about your book, which is called Before You Leave. And uh, Todd and I um, met through a mutual friend and uh, ended up in Dallas, Texas together. Um, went to a Cowboys game. They lost. <laughs> Um, and, but that stadium is quite something, isn't it? Yes, it is. It is. It is the kingdom of this world. It has the hole in the roof, I guess, on some level, right? You know, with the old Cowboy Stadium, when Billy Graham was the first event there with the crusade, he said that, you know, they left the hole there so God could watch his favorite team. So it's, they're not just America's team. <laughs> right. They're also God's favorite oh team. We know gosh. that. Oh my <laughs> goodness. I am imagining all of the Ohio people were about to be upsetting. I, I just wanted to start with a little bit of heresy so we could clean it up. <laughs> right. Upsetting people is what we do, Maggie. This is accurate. So, this is so, true. Um yeah, well, you can't really if there were a hole in the ceiling, you can't see it because of the gigantic jumbotron that's up there that takes up most of the building, actually. But anyway, the, um, the people who are in the box seats. Mm. Yeah, that's right. That's right. <laughs> um, Todd, tell us tell us a little bit about yourself, where you're from, and what you do. Yeah, I am a I am a sinner saved by grace. I am from Dallas, Texas, originally, and gosh, I feel like I should be a military kid. I mean, my dad was in the in the army, but I, we, you know, I traveled a lot uh, around so much since being married for now 24 years. I think we've, we've moved probably eight or 10 times. Uh, but really, uh, I came to faith in college uh, in terms of really owning my faith. It was kind of um, in my heart along the way growing up, but, but the head and heart really didn't connect. And we'll talk about some of that. How I went to, to college thinking I was ready to you know, live out my faith for Christ. And I just really got beat up. And, um, and, you know, it was my fault. But I am married to a, um, a therapist. And I jokingly say I'm her best client. And therefore, I don't have to see a therapist because I'm married to her. And, and every time I say that, she says, don't say that anymore. Um, I've got two, two boys, a 20, 20 year old who's a junior at NYU. Uh, and then I have a almost 14 year old who wishes he was a junior at NYU. Um, I, I've got a pretty eclectic background. It, it's interesting. Uh, University of Texas undergrad, uh, Duke Divinity School, SMU, and then I've got some, you know, conservative evangelical seminary training in the middle. And what I love about this is people, no matter who I meet, whatever context, you know, I'll usually get, okay, you went to Duke or an SMU. Do you do you still believe in the authority of the scriptures? Or I'll, you know, um, I'll, or I'll be in a more conservative you know, context and, and, you know, they'll say something like, you know, really the same question, but they're trying to figure out, well, who is this guy? How in the world and why in the world is he in so many different contexts? And I remember uh, when I was on my way to Duke, uh, one of my, you know, Baptist professors at this other school was really trying to discourage me saying I would lose my faith. And, um, and then another one said, you know, oh, wonderful. I hope you go there. I hope you get the degree. And I hope a lot of these mainline or moderate or progressive churches invite you to come preach. And you can simply just preach the word of God and people will come up to you and say, oh, we haven't heard preaching like that, and which has happened. And I'll say, well, what do you, and I'm not some great expositor. I mean, um, but they'll just say, oh, we, we seldom actually walk through a passage of scripture. We usually just get one or two passages and then a bunch of stories. And I think that's the state of the church in many places today. And I know you and I've talked about that a little bit, David, but um, what do I do? I, I, thanks be to God, I travel the country. I speak on college campuses. 
uh, at fraternities, parachurch groups, um, oftentimes youth groups, high schools. I even have a ministry with uh, professionals in recovery in a couple of different cities that are just, uh, they're alcoholics and, you know, once an alcoholic, always an alcoholic. The bottle worked for a while and then it didn't. And many of these guys are now have turned to the Lord. So that's really been a cool ministry. Um, so I'm just, I'm having a lot of fun. I, I'm kind of all over the place. I'm a senior fellow at King's College in New York City, a senior fellow at Southeastern Seminary in Wake Forest. And then I am a presidential scholar at Dallas Baptist University, and I still teach for them um, each each semester. So in a nutshell, I guess that's me. Ask, you know, ask whatever you want, or we can dive into book or whatever. Ask what, what years you were at Duke? Yeah, I was there um, 08 through, let's see, 08, 09 for the, my degree. And then I actually worked there for a couple of years in the Divinity School as well as in the School of Public Policy. I was there earlier. Scott okay. was there oh, back in the 70s. Time, we went to we Duke the as well. We're kids roughly we're awesome. the same age, but nope. <laughs> so, all right. Yeah, I joke with people. I, you know, I'm still a believer. All right. So, Good. Well, th thanks for that. And when you teach courses, what kind of courses are they? Well, Scott, you'd appreciate this. I've taught the history of Christianity for about a decade or so and love it and learn something new every, every week, I think. Uh, yeah. I've also taught spiritual formation and... <laughs> Yeah, U.S. history, um, you know, books of the Bible, New Testament survey, things like that. So, David, I guess we share that in common as well. Yeah. However, I'm not like you guys. And then, Todd, we were uh, both good friends with the late, great Billy Abraham. Yeah. Um, talk a little bit about your relationship with Billy. I had read Billy for a number of years prior to meeting him, and when I knew I needed to leave Duke to be back in Dallas uh, to help care for my father and, you know, working on a degree at SMU, um, you know, I, I've, I reached out to Billy, and he said, yeah, I've, I'm busy. I've got 30 minutes. I'd love to meet you, and like many um, people, we, you know, we met at his home away from home, his second office there at La Madeline by SMU. And that 30 minute conversation turned into about two hours. And by the time it was over, he had basically convinced me, you know, that he would, you know, he would be my advisor in the doctoral program. And little did I know he would really become kind of a spiritual father to me. I mean, I just, I don't know of anyone I've ever met that had that um, level of intellect and yet had a, had a heart as big as well. And, you know, mind of a <laughs> mind of a scholar, heart of a pastor lived it out even his critics respected him because he knew that they loved, he knew that they knew he loved them and respected them. And though he was the smartest guy in the room in any context, uh, he was always very humble and he made everyone feel welcome. And he just encouraged people to pursue truth and to not be afraid to go wherever the evidence would lead them. And, you know, I just, I learned so much from him. I miss him terribly. There's not a day that goes by that I don't think about him and pray for his, his, uh, his, his wife and his, his two kids. And, and, he, and, and, and also just to also want to strive to be like him, someone that would really burn the candle at both ends for the Lord to not waste time to know that every day is a gift and an opportunity to glorify God. And so, um, you know, he always had a book or, you know, a book and a pen in his hand, and, um, and I try to do the same thing, you know, so I've just, it, it's amazing the impact he had on my life of, over the, you know, about a decade and uh, you as well. I know David is, and also yeah, our yeah. beautiful friend, Michael and, and many others who have met him. So I just hope that all of us collectively can fill that void to try to make a difference for the, you know, for the Lord and be a light, uh, the way he yeah. was. It will take more than one person to do Absolutely. that. Certainly well, army. Right. But he did disciple a lot of people. Absolutely. And so, um, and that's part of his legacy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, um, when you go to talk at these different venues, yeah, what what are your favorite topics to talk about? You know, it's interesting. There's been a number. I mean, I'll talk about prayer. Uh, um, you know, often I'll just talk about spiritual disciplines. Uh, but, you know, whether it's the fraternity guys, sometimes some of the more skeptic groups that, you know, that show up, um, you know, I, I was at NC State, you know, uh, in the student union open to everyone. We had a ton of people coming and going and the topic was reasons to believe Christianity. And it just led to some really rich 
um, dialogue in questions with skeptics and non-believers. So I always enjoy that. Um, the, the one topic in, in the book, I have a chapter on the spiritual realm. It's called Speak of the Devil. And mm. that, that's the one that most of the younger people, high school and college students, actually want to talk about. I mean, yeah. you, I, I can walk into a fraternity, and I, I wasn't in Greek life, uh, and yet, you know, God has let me in. So I'll, I'll go in, and some of these guys are trying to figure out, well, who is this dude? And without fail, I can just ask the simple question or questions you know, do you, do you consider yourself a spiritual person? And have you ever had anything happen to you that you can't explain by natural? Um, there's no natural explanation. In other words, you, someone, you know, love, trust, not trying to mislead you has had some type of spiritual encounter that's beyond the norm that you want to talk about. And without fail, I can ask those two questions and we end up talking for an hour or two. And I was at a fraternity at university of Georgia with 12 guys we talked for over two hours. The second time I went back there, we had 50 guys there. And they just, they were so hungry to talk about spiritual realm and life. And I think, um, I just think that if anyone's, you know, paying attention, there are just things that we're noticing in the culture today that were, I guess, more hidden or, or less obvious, probably when we were younger. You mm -hmm. know, Paul describes the devil as an angel of light. Peter describes the the devil as a roaring lion. Okay, well, which one is it? Well, I think in the West, particularly in America, I think it's been more of the angel of light. Um, and I think of the C.S. Lewis quote from the Screw Tape Letters, and he's, you know, and some of the tactics there by the demonic are that you hope that you don't realize they exist, and once you do, that you can either dismiss that um, with either comedy or just to say I don't know. And yet, I think what we're seeing. Um, unfortunately, and yet at the same time, fortunately, in our culture and in America today is that there are things happening that people cannot deny. Yeah. Uh, I'll give you an example. I had a, a gentleman who's a vice president um, of, a, of a tech company, very successful, known this man for years, um, ran into him in public not long ago. And he said, you know, hey, can I haven't seen you in forever. COVID, we were all kind of in, in caves. And I just have some questions and I think you're the one to talk to. So I, I met him a couple of days later for lunch and he looked at me and he said, you know, I've got all this formal training and education. I'm a, I'm a tech guy. And he said, I don't, I think there might be a higher power. Um, you know, I've read, I've read the Bible a little bit growing up, but I'm not really very religious. He said, but what I'm about to say to you and why I wanted to talk to you is because I don't know who else to speak with about this because they'll think I'm crazy. He said, but I am 100% convinced based on what I'm seeing in the culture through the media and just everyday life that, that there is, I, I cannot deny it. I wish I could, but I know there's some form of demonic supernatural stuff taking place. And he said, and, and in fact, I lose sleep over this. And I really wish I could believe in God the same way. Oh, wow. And I said, well, because you can, you, you cannot deny this and it is real. You know, you're halfway to the idea of, of the benevolent God, the God of the Bible. And I think the, the, the key is to press into that and to start this journey. And so we've been on this subsequent journey together, reading different things, looking at history. What does the scripture say? Um, you know, I didn't think we would, you know, I didn't realize we would, you know, dive into this, but maybe that's the way it's supposed to be. So Maggie, you look like oh. you're Yeah, no. Uh, well, I mean, you're talking about a, an, a realm of ministry that I work in quite a bit. Yeah. And so I'm just listening. I mean, um, and I agree with everything you're saying. I mean, I am particularly interested in um, just in a lot of the own min the ministry that I do. Um, I find myself speaking a lot to adults in my generation. So I'm in my 40s and older talking to them about the differences in culture now versus, say, for instance, pre I, I always use the marker. Um, of 9-11 yeah sort of so um and um just how i don't know well i mean i do know what it is about that date that was so was so sort of like uh such a cultural line of demarcation but what's fascinating is is everything that's happened after that that is sort of uprooted you know um trust in institutions and the way we look at truth and it being very subjective and, and anchored to individual experience and things like that. 
a lot of times I find myself having this conversation with um, adults or, or people in Gen X and boomers where I say, listen, the way that young people approach spirituality now is not it's in, very different from how we do or how we did. And there's a much more of a sort of a, almost like a, an egalitarian view of like everything is of equal value. Everything is equally neutral. Uh, until you discern its use or benefit to you personally. Right. That's right. And, um, and I, I find that really fascinating. I was having, having a conversation with someone not too long who described themselves as as an atheist, someone who um, goes to my son's high school, which is a classical Christian school. Mm -hmm. And um, he was like, I'm an atheist, but I mean, I'm not, it's not that I'm not spiritual. Right. And I was like, well, well, and, and it's fascinating. Because because, are you encountering? <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. So uh, all of the things you're saying, I, I encounter this kind of thing all the time. It's really interesting um, to talk to older people and they, it, their the categories are so different now. I feel like they have, you know, I find a lot of frustration in, in sort of pastors that I try to talk to about this. Sometimes they're like, well, what they need to do is they just need to come to church and they just need to do this. And they, and I'm like, okay, I get it. I love church. I mean, I'm married to a pastor. Right. I, but also, but also we should understand the worldview that they're coming from is a, a, a different animal. Okay. Um, yes. I'm curious, how did you start going to fraternities or college campuses or things like that? I mean, you know, someone with your educational background might find themselves, you know, more squarely in the realm of academia. You know, I've always had a heart for younger people um, and have just worked with youth, got two, you know, boys of my own. And, um, you know, being in private school education, I've been a chaplain, headmaster, you know, so I've just been around youth for a long time, and um, I guess I'm I'm just young at heart. I just think that the formative years of our lives for each one of us, you know, you kind of decide along the way once you have the autonomy of being 18 and away from home of, you know, what is it that I believe and why do I believe it? And yeah. it's challenged. And, you know, your parents, they say, you know, they become wiser as we become older. That's true. But I also think that sometimes that that generational faith, the faith perhaps of our grandparents or parents, the context of that was very different than what we're seeing today. In other words, in a, just let's talk about evangelism for a moment. Well, you know, you had the four spiritual laws and, or you had, you know, you could just walk up to someone and say, Hey, Maggie, um, do you know, <laughs> you know, you start using this, this Christianese. This yes. Do you know the Lord? And, uh, yeah. today, do you know, if you know, and, and those things may, nothing's changed there in terms of the, the, the reality of it all. But in terms of the language of how to speak to people, most people have no biblical framework because our culture is becoming increasingly, um, I guess, they're biblically illiterate is, mm -hmm. is lack of a better way to say it. And so you can't really start with the same approaches that, um, you know, our parents or grandparents may have taken. I was speaking to an older gentleman couple months ago and and he asked me he said well what is it that you say to these young people on these campuses or when you're in a fraternity meet? and i and i said well usually i you know i just ask them are you know you consider yourself a spiritual person yeah tell me about that and he said he says well why don't you ask them if they know jesus as our lord and savior that's what i say to people when i'm at chick-fil-a or wherever else and and god bless him and there's nothing wrong with that approach yeah. a lot of these younger younger people they just look at you like what um, yeah. and, and you know what I mean? It, it's just, it's very different. The gospel hasn't changed, but the way in which we try to communicate it to people has to, because we're dealing with the generation. Um, most of them have not only not read the Bible, but they don't read anything and they're getting the sound bites in these little excerpts yeah. in social media networks. Right. Yeah. Well, yeah. And if they're at Chick-fil-A, of course they know Jesus as their Lord. Oh and Savior. my gosh. That's God's chicken. <laughs> oh, yeah. We well, need to get Jerry to start serving that at the Cowboys games. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Right. Well, uh, we actually just had a conversation with considerable overlap to, to what you've just said just a week ago, actually. And we were discussing how important it is for 
Christianity to maintain the integrity of its vocabulary. Because say, for instance, that phrase, do you know Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior? The word Lord and the word Savior has a very particular implication and meaning. Right. Um, and it's important for those things to maintain integrity. At the same time, when you begin evangelizing someone, you want to start where they are and sort of yeah. like bring them over to what Lord and Savior might mean. Yeah. Um, but um it, yeah, it's an interesting process. I like that question. Do you consider yourself a spiritual person? Because one of the things I feel like I'm noticing a lot, um, when I was in high school, which would have been in the, um, you know, the 80s and I, or the early 70s. 90s <laughs> for David, <laughs> um, uh, in the early 90s, I would have considered culture, not that I had a very defined spiritual vocabulary at that point, but I was a Christian, um, but I would have considered culture secular, and my definition of that secularity would have been that it was sort of spiritually neutral, right. which was naive. Yeah. <laughs> but um, now I look at culture and I think, oh, this is pagan. Right. This is, yeah. this is not just secular. Yeah. This is, there's spirituality all over the place. Sure. But it's, um, like you said earlier, it has roots in a lot of demonic occultic origins. Yeah, and it manifests itself in different ways. Mm -hmm. uh, an easy target here would be to talk about Marxism for a moment. I mean, Marx uh, was one who, if you read any of his actual poetry, he devotes some of it to the devil. Really mm -hmm. interesting. And there's one, there's one quote I remember from Marx that he said, you know, my soul that once belonged to God is now destined for hell. Well... Yeah. And so, and, and with Marx, I mean, you can talk about redistribution of wealth and you can look at passage in Acts and how everyone shared and had all things in common and all these things that sound great. But in our, in our secular, quote unquote, secular culture, um, that, that's just something to lead with, to convince people to buy into an ideology that at the end of the day is really lacking. Um, and it tends to be the ones in power, whether it's just talking about the church or even within, you know, economics or in our culture, so much of it's about power, you know, mm -hmm. in the church, father, son, Holy spirit, <laughs> separate, but equal, uh, in the world, uh, it was sex, drugs, and rock and roll. Now it's, I think sex, money, power, they kind of all go together. And if you follow that trail of the power and the money, which always go hand in hand and the ones who hold that, it's interesting how they will use whatever form of terminology, ideology, programs, promises, you know, everyone gets religious usually in the political campaigns right up until being elected and then their true colors shine after the fact. Um, but the ultimate, it, it's not about redistribution of wealth. It's not about some of the things, these things that are being parroted that might work in the culture, but it's how people are really living. And the four of us realize that the, the ultimate human problem, though these things can help, ultimately can only be truly satisfied and remedied by, by Christ, by the love of God, by God's grace. And nations don't become Christians. People do one at a time. And mm -hmm. Jesus did meet each person where they were. And he loved them as they were for who they were, not as they should be, because none of us are as we should be. And I think with young people today and really anyone, even the bigger kids like us, um, you, you, you do. You have to meet them where they are. You have to see them as God sees them, and that is a child made in his image that is broken, that inherited this sinful nature, that likes, you know, that, that enjoys sin, right? We all are into things that we're tempted by things that we probably have no business dealing with. I mean, I mean, that's just the world of advertising, right? You know, yeah. that convince us, especially this time of year, to buy things that we don't need. <laughs> and yet, and if the best advertisers will get us to do that. But I think in the spiritual realm, it's the same thing. I think that uh, there are things that we're prone to succumb to just because we're human and we have a sinful nature and we're bent towards sin. And then we're in a world that is broken and fallen. Sinners among sinners in this fallen, broken world at best. And then there's the demonic, I think, that can exploit so many of these things, even in our own bad decisions, uh, that will cause us just to, to not really live uh, to be disciples of Christ, right? And, and there's this, this war, this war. And when I read scripture and I think about Paul's passage of Paul said, I know what it is that I should do. And I still don't do it. Sure. And, Paul, and Paul said, you know, I'm the chief of sinners. 
And he wasn't just being modest and saying, oh, you know, I'm a sinner. No, he meant it. He struggled big time. And when you look at the scriptures and actually read it, you'll see that everyone struggled big time. I mean, you've got Peter, who was the first pope that, you know, that Christ says, you're Petra. I'm going to build my church on you. And yet he's the most insatiable, the most impatient, and the one that even denied Christ three times. And then you look at, you know, Moses, who murdered someone. You look at Paul, who was, uh, you know, ravaging the church and, and wrote half the New Testament. And I mean, I just all these people. And yet here we are today trying to be disciples of Christ like they these people were and to know that, hey, we're going to screw it up. And the young people are really going to screw it up. Right. And I I think what I've learned is my approach is really to meet them where they are, to let them know that it's okay to not be okay, that this is really a safe space, that there's nothing off limits. You can ask me about anything. I, I'm maybe I missed it, but did you, did you tell us like how you first got invited to a frat though? I didn't, but I'll come back. Yeah. So, so So I was in Greek life and uh, I don't know the secret handshakes and that. So how did I get in? No, it were, these were students that I had mentored along the way. And at four or five different colleges, we just stayed in touch. You know, they know they can still call me and they do. And I love it. And I just had to continue to mentor them. And so they had opened the door and invited me in. And as I mentioned, the example at Georgia, it starts with 12 guys. The next time I came back, there were 50, you know, and, and as, and as we've seen, um, why would any of these younger people truly want to listen to any of the four of us? They, they really, their peers are who they'll yeah. listen to. But what I have found is oftentimes if, if one of the peers says, Hey, this book's okay, or this guy's okay or whatever, that can open the door and lead to a deeper conversation. But back to what you said, Maggie, about inviting them to church and how people say that, well, a lot of these people, that's the last thing they want to do. Yeah. You know, ministry in New York is that I'm involved in. And that, I mean, these people, they, they don't even know who Tim Keller is and they don't care. Right. No, no, and, they don't. And, and they don't want to go to church. And it's in, in so many of the things they see, the, the, you know, these caricatures, these unfortunate caricatures that can be true. It's easy to just dismiss that and go, I don't want to waste my time on Wednesday night or Sunday or whatever. Why would I want to be involved in that? Yeah. So I've, I've found that the fraternities have really been a very uh, ripe opportunity for me to just go in there and meet them on their turf. You know, some of the times the guys are, you know, they're, they're drinking, they'll, they'll come through yelling about whatever. Some of them will, they weren't part of the original group and they'll pull up a chair and, and I love it. It's beautiful. Yeah. Uh, so it's funny because, um, I, I, there's a, there's a research Institute. Like, I, I mean, I, I read a lot of, <laughs> I read a lot of, um, research polls and things like that, just about evangelism and stuff like that, because the ministry that I work for spirit and truth, we are in evangelism and equipping ministry. And I'm constantly recommending one particular research Institute called spring tide research. And they focus entirely on Gen Z. And um, I'm constantly recommending them to pastors. And I'm saying, look, you know, research institutes, they have their ups and their downs. They have their high points and low points, but you know, if you, if you really are serious about learning about younger people, this is a sort of an objective and safe way to do it. It's not my opinion because a lot of times, you know, um, and I'm I fully empathetic and understand, but a lot of pastors can get a little, um, understandably defensive because we expect pastors to a meet every single preference and need and, you know, and and it's not possible and they want their churches to be full they want people to come to christ they want all yeah. of those things to work too and you know they often feel like they're being asked to solve an unsolvable problem mm-hmm. but sometimes i'm like okay it's really true like these the generation of people who are going to inevitably come to the church at some point are not liturgically educated. You know what I mean? Like they have no knowledge of the sort of the accoutrement of church culture. They're not necessarily biblically literate. They do not care about when your potluck is every month. They don't care about the men's group or the women's group or the fulls in October or whatever, that none of that stuff matters to them. What they really, really want, what they value more than anything is relationship. 
That's exactly right. Because they have very little trust in institutional structure or authority. And that's why when you say, you know, you've kept in touch with one person, if we as adults can, and I say as adults, I mean, I, I receive discipleship from my spiritual elders too, but if, if we can reinvest in just the love of relational Christian living, you know, instead of sort of this anesthetized sort of way of living where everything's neat and tidy in church and nobody's in each other's crud, if we can get back to sort of that way of living together, praying together, doing life with Jesus together, we can build up the tolerance for mess, human mess. I have personally very little tolerance for human mess. I'm I'm the first to confess. But this is what... (laughs) And yet... And yet, (laughs) and yet, I am surrounded by 19 and 20-year-olds. And there's no shortage of interesting conversations with them but it's like you said they're beautiful conversations too absolutely and they're so hungry for spiritual mothers and fathers they are i think people imagine that that they're going to be shut down or they're going to be rejected that is not my experience no you're you're right and you know it's interesting everywhere i go with the young people whether it's a college campus or a high school to the best that i can i'll bring a box of books or someone bought you know, a hundred books and they're there. And of course I'm not going to sell these books to the kids or whatever, but I want to give them a book if they want one. And I typically talk to them after I, I will, I will give them my email address and I'll just say, Hey, if you ever have a prayer request, um, you know, or something you want to talk about theologically, you know, reach out to me and I will get at least one or two emails every single week. Oftentimes yeah. someone I met months ago or a year ago, um, because they just needed someone to, to talk to or that they thought they could trust or that would pray for them. Mm-hmm. And, and on one hand, that's sad because it tells me who else is in their life and why is there not other people like that that they feel like they can go to. And then I think in terms of the religious circles uh, and in our context with our own kids in that, for many of them, th- they they have been kind of in the spotlight or, or whatever you want to call about it, it you know, is it being a, you know, a the, the son of a, a preacher or a, you know, a Christian faculty member, and they don't want to disappoint us and they don't, yeah. they can voice those questions, you know, or express that doubt. And so they do need someone else, you know, to, you know, another, that, that's why it's so important that we have, you know, like in your case, Scott, you mentioned, you know, the, the godfather of, you know, your, your child, or, you know, that you have these, these mentors, these others in their lives and I mean, I can't even tell you how many students I know at campuses across this country who, I mean, I'm just, you know, I'm more of an acquaintance and I'll back and forth on some emails and I do my best to try to plug them into to fellowship and into churches. But a lot of them, as you said, they're starving. They, mm-hmm. they don't know of a program or even a, a youth group that will truly disciple them. They don't know what they're missing. In other words, like many of these youth ministries, um, uh, and I'm not knocking the youth ministers. I know many of them, their their hands are full. It's a tough time. Uh, we just went through COVID. But, you know, a lot of the Wednesday night services or even Sunday mornings, a lot of it's very topical. And, and if the kids only are there for that 45 minutes or hour once or twice a week, and they're not like being discipled by their parents or someone else to really do life with them and walk that journey daily, then what will happen, and this is what we we continue to see, and increasingly so, is that you're just going to have kids with an anemic understanding of of you know basic doctrines, who God is, who they are, and the foundation is just weak, it's cracked at best, and then they go to college thinking, you know, like I did, oh, I'm ready to go live out my faith for God, and then you're around everyone else who's not, and you mm-hmm. just realize I can either. Um, I'm either going to run with the crowd or I'm going to look like a dork and it's impossible to stand alone here. Right. And then, and then, you know, and again, there's, there's well-meaning campus ministries, but a lot of the groups that are neglected the most, unfortunately in the churches, I don't know about your respective churches, but it's those college kids, right? It's, I know they're transient, but, I, but I'll go all over the country and even speak at large churches that have resources, and I'll ask them, what type of college ministry do you have? And even in some, some towns or cities that have multiple colleges, 
they'll say, well, we don't have anyone designated for that position. We have a great youth group. And then we have this, the young adults and there's nothing for the college. Nothing. Yeah. For the college. So at a time when they're most vulnerable, then they're seeking, asking the questions of, uh, you know, that tends to be the time where we tend to turn our back on them collectively. Uh, and so what do they do? They just go the way of their friends. They don't want religion to what they call religion to get in the way of their newfound freedom and convict them. So, so they just party and do the thing college students do. And then that determines who they might date and then marry. And then there you go. There's the cycle. It's broken as opposed to they, they went through the junk. They had a place to ask those questions, to figure things out with someone who would listen and walk it with them, the journey with yeah. them. And they realized, hey, I can actually do this. I can not only follow Jesus as a college student and even being in a fraternity, but it's actually cool and it's rewarding. And I'll have and I see the peers say to me, how do you have this joy and you're not getting hammered all the time and you're just making wise decisions and you're not getting in trouble like most of us are. And I want and I've seen I'm speaking from experience because I can give you a dozen kids who are in fraternities that party like there's no tomorrow, right? They're drinking like they're alcoholics and these kids are sober and, and they're loving life and they're leaders. So it can be done, but I think it starts in college. I mean, it starts in high school and it continues into college. And we just hope that we have people that will mentor these kids when they do leave home in their youth groups or that are just there on the side to say, Hey, I live in this college town or, or, and you know, so-and-so's daughter or son is there and I'm going to make sure to stay in touch with them more than just a graduate high school graduation gift. I want to check on them and call them once a week or send them an email or a card and let them know I'm praying for them. Just being so, intentional. So that kind of leads us into a discussion of your book, Todd, uh, which is called before you leave for college career and eternity published by King's college press. And uh, I mean, you've said a little bit about this, but tell us, why you wrote this book and what what you intend from it you know it was gosh over two decades in the making and much, much of it stemmed early from my own experience as i mentioned i you know went to a public high school but you know was involved in youth groups sporadically went to college thinking you know i'm i'm a christian and i'll take a class in you know in religion or you know something to do with christianity and i did and i had a professor who was a priest and the guy knew the Bible probably as well as anyone I'd ever met. And he just challenged me on my on my lack of understanding of scripture. And I and I quoted some things out of context. And he he let me in the class know. And I just felt stupid. And I realized, you know, if God really inspired the words of a book and I'm to base my life on it, I probably should read it and know what it says. You know, um, there are other books, whether it's, you know, or, or movies, even Star Wars, you know, Harry Potter, whatever, that I know so much more about than I probably do the meta narrative of scripture. And if someone brings up something that's incorrect, I can point it out and spot it quickly. And yet what I've what I have learned along the way from my own journey is with scripture, I couldn't do that. And so I didn't even know oftentimes that I was being misled or, or people were just blatantly lying to me because I didn't know what scripture actually said. And we're lifelong learners. And as I continue to learn the scriptures, I, I just realized that um, this needs to be part of my daily life. And it's just not for most kids, even that grow up in Christians' homes. And um, I've, having worked with youth and, like I said, in secondary schools and as a college professor and chaplain, I just realized um, increasingly so how biblically illiterate kids are. And much of that's because their parents are as well, or they just they don't read the Bible um, and they don't know what it says and they don't understand doctrine or church history. And so because of those reasons, and because a lot of the questions and the concerns and doubts that just popped up, I mean, just hundreds of times from many students in different contexts, unbeknownst to one another, I would keep hearing the same questions that were not being addressed at home or in youth groups. And so we would work through them together. And so I thought, you know, I really am feeling led to write a book about these things. Uh, these topics that are that are biblical, they're part of tradition, but they're seldom, if ever, discussed. And so, therefore, you're going into the real world, into college and beyond, and you have, you know, only a Hollywood version of, you know, the demonic or hell, <laughs> you know, and which are which are incorrect and non-biblical, and those things are easy to dismiss or or laugh off. Uh, um, so I thought, let me write about these things, and so that's what happened, and so. Yeah, it took me about a year probably to write it. 
it's been out for a couple years I'd be now. Interested in, in, in just talking about the, the the structure of the book, right? I mean, yeah. you begin with you know questions about scripture, and then yeah. talking about rejecting God, and then you get into the demonic and and hell, and and end up with prayer. And I'm just I'm just curious, always curious about like why why did you why did you take us on that journey, right? Why did you start here and end up here? Yeah. Excellent question. And I could have started with that second chapter, which kind of just deals with worldview and rejecting God. And um, but I thought, you know, because I'm going because I want to establish the fact that scripture is trustworthy, it's authoritative, it's inspired by God. And because I'm going to be referencing that so much throughout the book after dealing with cultural references in the everyday language, I'll then be referring to scripture as that ultimate authority. I need to work through this and it, have it be the longest or foundational part of the book right up front. So I hit these issues head on. I mean, I talk about how did we get the Bible? You know, the Apostle Paul mentions a couple of letters in his writings that are sacred scripture in the canon that aren't in the canon. So we know Paul wrote other letters. Well, why weren't those letters in the canon? right? Were they not inspired by God? Who determined that? When was it determined? And so I get into some of the councils. I get into the process that was involved in the early centuries and just things that we don't learn in Sunday school along the way. Um, I, I'm, I'm not scared to talk about things like the missing verse in John chapter five, verse four. Well, well why is that not there? And how come even as in evangelical Christians, you open up your Bible, whether it's the NIV, the ESV, whatever version, and there's brackets or notations to say the original manuscripts, the early manuscripts do not contain this passage. And you're like, what? What is that? So I get into these things and just establish to say that, look, these are valid questions. You don't just dismiss them. Uh, when I was learning about these these textual issues, these textual criticism in college, I went back to the well-meaning people in my life that knew God. They knew the Bible. They loved me. I could ask him anything. And I started bringing up these things, some of the ones I've just mentioned, and I would get one of several responses. They would either say, oh, that person doesn't know the author of the Bible. You shouldn't be taking a class like that. Or they would say, oh, the devil's behind that, just trying to pull you away from the truth of scripture. Or they'd say, I don't know. I have never heard that. And I'm thinking, wow, well, here I am as 18 or 19 year old. You're not helping me. My peers don't know any different. This teacher is holding my grade, you know, and if I speak up in class, I'm, you know, they know much more than I ever will, and I'm going to be made to look stupid. And so I'll just kind of sit on these questions and doubts. And so I thought, let me attack that. Let me handle that right up front. And so that's why I started with that, that section or that chapter, and it's the longest and probably the most academic. But then it starts to become a little bit more user-friendly, reader-friendly with the Rejecting God chapter. And just to say, hey, everyone, everyone has a belief system, right? We all believe something ultimate. Um, and the people that I've met that re that say they're atheist or reject God, when I hear their story, if I had to base my life on that version of God that they're describing, I would probably have a hard time being a Christian as well. And it's really easy to dismiss the non-biblical versions of Christianity that are so prevalent in our culture. But whenever someone meets someone like a Billy Abraham, who really, you know, walked the talk, right? Um, it makes Christianity very compelling. And, and so I, I try to get into that. And there's a, that form of evangelism of, well, first off, you have to have friends who are non-Christians because we, t we tend to, to want to be in our holy huddles and with like-minded people. And yet, you know, we have no idea what the non-believing world is reading or thinking about. And, uh, we, you know, we're living in the arena or garden of redemption. And if we don't understand the soil in which we're trying to plant these seeds of truth of the gospel, well, it won't blossom or sprout. And I think that's one of the problems that many of us have. We can easily point to people being biblically illiterate. Well, most Christians are culturally illiterate, and that can be just as big of a problem. So that's second chapter. Third chapter really deals with the spiritual realm. Speak of the devil. And again, this is the thing that most younger people want to talk about and are interested in. And I think Hollywood reflects that with TV shows and movies that are there that are so common um, that people just love. And uh, so I get into those things and what does scripture say? And then the fourth chapter, um, what the hell? Um, you know, you hear that street preacher who's barking at people and Turner burn and this, that, and it just makes you cringe. And you're just like, 
oh my gosh, these people have no biblical framework. They don't know what you're talking about. You so you sound so hateful and crazy and whatever. And so we just avoid it. And I had a gentleman in California who had read my book and reached out to me and said, Todd, I loved your book. It made me think. I've been an elder at this church in San Francisco for 30 years. And he said, um, I really have a trouble. I have trouble about seeing God as a judge in any way. I see God as like my grandmother who loves me unconditionally would never judge me. And he said, I just, and I've never heard a sermon about hell in my decades of being an elder at this Presbyterian church. And so we talked for about an hour. And when it was over, he said, wow, okay, that actually makes the, the good news great. Thank you for explaining that to me. And so with all the chapters, I'm just trying to start a conversation to get people to think critically. And at the end, there are questions for reflection. And then at the end, if you've made it that far, especially after getting through the demonic and hell, let's pray, right? So what is prayer? Why should we pray? Is it effective? Why do people pray differently? Is there a right or wrong way to pray? Uh, and so I deal with that. I deal with that at the very end. So the bookends are the Bible and prayer, and then a lot in between. And then the, the concluding chapter really is just kind of a spiritual intellectual uh, checkup, if you will, to say, all right, we've walked through these things. Don't know if you believe in God or the Bible or or the devil or hell, but you have to admit or acknowledge your own mortality that, um, you know, we're all dying from the moment we're born life expectancy, 76 years now. And, um, there's a universal longing for something beyond the grave. And so what does that look like? And all of these things go together, right? What is a human? Are we made in the image of God? Are we the form of Darwinian means? Uh, is there a soul or not? Is there life beyond the grave? And so that's kind of that that thread of eternity. That's why the subtitle, you know, before you leave for college, career, and eternity, no matter what age you are, 16 up, I think there's enough in here to to have to help people have or guide them through some really important conversations that don't happen often, unfortunately. And that's ultimately why I wrote the book. I think it's a really helpful text, Todd. Um, I think. It's one, first of all, that churches could just give to kids who are going, who are graduating. You know, maybe they're not going to college, but they're they're leaving home anyway, yeah. and um, they're not going to be. You know, like like I was raised in the church and went to a state school. We went to church every week, and I was in youth group and everything like that. But I really wasn't intellectually prepared it, at all. This isn't the fault of my church. I mean, I don't know many churches that do this, but um, I wasn't really intellectually prepared at all for what I was going to encounter in like a college class Bible is literature. Right. Which you is know. the same case with me. Yes. And, and boy, I, I had just had a ton of questions after that. I mean, what, what in the world? Yep. And so um, uh, a book like this would have been been helpful at that time, but I also think it could be useful for um, uh, non or or new Christians of any age, really, um, mm -hmm. because they're gonna they probably already heard arguments against Christianity, and there's an apologetic quality to this work. And by apologetic, I I mean um, making a defense of Christianity um, without being defensive. But yeah. demonstrating the reasonableness and coherence of Christianity. Maybe that's a better way to put it. That was the hope. Yeah. 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 And I think you do a good job of that. And so I think for new Christians, um, this could be helpful as well. And um, because if, if they haven't heard arguments against Christianity, which seems unlikely at this point, they will. They will. And yeah. so we need to to be able to clear out some of those roadblocks as we're walking alongside people in faith. Yeah, absolutely. No, I appreciate you saying that. That was the hope and the prayer, you know, and there are parts of it. It's, it's meaty. You know, I've even had pastors say to me, you know, I can usually just fly through a book, but with this one, I had to stop and reflect and just think about this a little bit more. And, and that that's a compliment to me. I, I think, I, I know I could have shortened it, condensed it, Maybe that would be more helpful for some people, but I really wanted it to be something that would maybe sit on that shelf and be taken down from time to time. And that's why I have the questions at the end of each chapter. Um, I mean, I, I have, I mean, I've seen high school youth groups walk through this book. I've seen those in nursing homes, I literally in the seventies, eighties, walk through the book, read through it, small groups, 
uh, it's a little misleading when you see college career attorney because you th see the word college first and you think, oh, well, you know, I'm 30, I don't need this. And yet you neglect the career and attorney part. But really, I think it's for those of all ages. That's one thing Billy said about it. And I failed to mention that earlier, but he Billy really encouraged me to write this book as well. He did. He just he saw enough of my work and things we had talked about over the years that he just said, yeah. And and not only should you write it, I want to write the forward to it. And of course, yeah, me, gosh, wow, that that may be the coolest thing that's ever happened in my life, apart from <laughs> salvation and marriage and having kids, you know, is that the Billy Abraham um, would encourage me in that way and be willing to put his name on it. And uh, so. Yeah. 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 That well, so it does have a forward by Billy Abraham. The book is called Before You Leave for College, Career, and Eternity by Todd Von Helms. And so if you're listening out there, I'd encourage you to get a copy of it and look it over. Yeah. And Todd, if people are curious about how to reach out to you so that you can come speak at their youth group or their frat house, or um, uh, how could they get in touch with you? Thank you. No, I really appreciate that. You can you can go to just toddvonhelms.com, T-O-D-D-V-O-N-H-E-L-M-S.com. And there's a link there in terms of speaking. You can contact me in that way. Um, you can also just, e you can email me at tvonhelms at tkc.edu. That's for the kingscollege.edu. If you Google my name, that's going to pop up as well. Uh, but yeah, reach out to me if you have questions, if you would be interested in me speaking at your church or to your youth group or college group or Senior adult group, I would be honored. I'm, I'm kind of all over the country, really. It's it's really been a blessing. I'll try to plan one event, you know, one, one event's on the calendar, and I'll try to work around that. Like, maybe I'll come to Ohio one day and speak, you know, maybe I speak in a class and then a youth group that night or whatever. But I love to just meet new people, hear their questions and their stories, and, and just walk that journey with them together. It's really a lot of fun, and it's been yeah. fun to chat with you all today. So thanks. Thanks for having me. Yeah. No, it's been our pleasure. It's been a great conversation. Thanks for being and, here. And um, yeah. So, all right. Well, that's been our podcast for today, you guys. Thanks so much for listening. Check us out on Twitter at Holy Spirit Pod. Rate and like the podcast. And of course, the highest compliment you can give us is when you share this podcast with your friends and family. Um, be sure to check out Todd's book before you leave uh, for college, career, or eternity. And thank you so much, Todd. You're welcome. Thank you. Go Cowboys. <laughs> Blessings to all. All right. Great. We'll come back to you next time, guys. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Bye.